you all are ready for some deep things. Song of Solomon, I'm in chapter 2 tonight of the Song of Solomon. I don't know about you, Pastor, but growing up in the church, I never heard too many messages from the Song of Solomon. Personally, the more I read it, was the more I understood why. very graphic book in nature. Sometimes you have to remind yourself that it's actually the Bible. You're not reading something out of Playboy because it's very explicit. Matter of fact, uh, oftentimes I tell couples if you're having a hard time knowing what to say to each other, Read the Song of Solomon. You'll get plenty of ideas. <laughs> the problem with some of you is you would actually blush. You would actually be embarrassed. But it is the word of the Lord. Somebody say it's the word of God. One author said that if the Bible is holy, and indeed it is holy, and the Song of Solomon's is the Holy of Holies. It is a book of poetic intimacy. And if you want an understanding of the type of relationship that God is searching for with you, read the Song of Solomon. You will understand what level of intimacy he desires with you. He doesn't want superficial, stagnant, ritualistic, mundane, stoic. He's looking for the exuberant, the joyful, the loving, the excited, the intimacy that can only come from knowing each other. When the Bible says that Isaac knew Rebekah, that word knew means experienced. He experienced her. This is what God wants. He wants you to experience him. He is not wanting a religion. He is wanting a relationship. Chapter 2 of the Song of Solomon. Would you stand now, please, in honor to the word of the Lord? I want to thank God again. How many men were at the men's breakfast? Let me see. Amen. We had a wonderful time. The ladies cooked us uh, such good food. I told the men, I said, by the, the way they cook such good food and I've eaten, I said, I feel like a full gospel preacher. They, we just had such a wonderful time of fellowship, and we thank God for all the men, all the women that participated and tell you, if you were a brother and you weren't there, you really, you missed something God was doing that is lasting. Song of Solomon, chapter 2, verse 10 and verse 11. Unfortunately, there was nothing to record because the way the Lord ministered, there was just nothing to record. So there's no tape to give you either. It's one of those things you were there or you just weren't there. Let's read together. My beloved spake and said unto me, Rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away. For lo, the winter is past, the rain is over and gone. Can we read that again from verse 10? My beloved spake and said unto me, Rise up, my love, my fair one, come away. For lo, the winter is past. I want to stop, talk to you tonight, preach, speak to you on this subject of God's ultimate quest. God's ultimate quest. The Lord has something he is after. Would you ask the Lord to speak to you right now in your spirits and to your minds? Open us up to hear. Open us up to receive. Open us up to understand. 
Lamb of God, we've got to hear a word straight from you today. I thank you because there is none else like you in this place tonight. Speak, Lamb of God, speak, Lamb of God, speak, Lamb of God. God bless you as you are seated in the presence of the Lord. Repeat these words after me. Say, I'm too blessed. Oh, come on, say it like you are. I'm too blessed to be stressed with the devil's mess. You got to know you're blessed. You got to know you're blessed. There's some things you got to know that you are. And one thing you got to know is that you are blessed. Somebody say, I am blessed. Yes. Uh, Moses said, you're blessed in the city, blessed in the field, blessed in the country. It doesn't matter where you go, you are blessed. And it's good to know that you're blessed, because when you know that you're blessed, then, then the devil can't stress you out. The devil can't steal anything from you, because you know you're blessed. To appreciate the nature of the Song of Solomon, I could approach this two ways, to di dissect the book itself, or start from the beginning where the Song of Solomon was a thought in the mind of God. I have today, by the grace of God, to start from a beginning. Because if you really want to understand what God wants, you must travel with Him to where there was nothing. Nothing but God. There were no angels. There was no demons. There was no devil. There was God and God alone. There was no time. There were no limits. There were no universe. It was simply God and God alone. The desire of God is that he would have somebody to love. Somebody that would share in relationship with him. For love needs an object. The object of love is called the be loved. And so God wanted somebody to pour his love out on. God wanted someone to share in a romantic endeavor. God wanted someone that would choose him and willingly love him throughout all the oppositions. So in the mind of God, he created angels. But angels did not have choice. They were simply servants. They were attendants. Hebrews chapter 1 says, Are they not ministering spirits sent forth to minister to those who are the heirs of salvation? They were meant to be the attendant to whom God was searching for. God then, a man, created a universe. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, In the beginning God. God began to create the heavens and the earth. Then he begins to illustrate how he did it. He started wide with the heavens and the expanse. He, the Bible actually said that God said, let there be light and there was light. Everything was created by the spoken word of God. And you are the same way. What you speak is what you get. So God said, let there be light. And immediately, light be, light was. But then the Bible said, let the light be separated from the darkness. Do you recognize the fact that darkness and light didn't even realize it didn't belong together until God said, you break it up and part your ways. You don't belong together. Because God was making an illustration of what he was getting ready to do. He was going to separate the light from the darkness. He was going to have a people that loved him from a people that did not love him. He was going to have sheep versus goats. He was going to have wheat versus tares. That's why on the second day, it's a day of division. He separates. Then God began to call forth the earth out of the water. He started large in the heavens and went down to one planet called Earth. 
it was there on the earth that God began to set up a kingdom. He set up subjects upon the earth for the day six when he would set up a king. That king was man. He looked at man. He was made in his image. The Bible says that man was made in his image. God spoke, let us make man in our image after our likeness. This was not the plurality of persons, but this was that God was going to give to man what he had given to no other creature, himself. He was going to put the substance of himself into that being. That, that as he did, so the man could do. As he ruled and reigned, so the man could have dominion also. He put inside of that man the ability to speak. And in the man's mouth was power. The Bible said whatever Adam named the animals, that's what they were. What Adam said, that's the way it went. The Bible said God told Adam to dress and to keep the garden. That word keep means to guard. God empowered the man to keep his domain. He not only gave him authority, he gave him power. Authority was the right, power was the might. He gave him the right and the might to rule. The Bible says that in fact God decided it was God's decision. It was not man's decision. It was God's decision. That it was not good for man to be left alone. For man had been noticing everything else had a mate but himself. It is not good for man to be left alone. So God put the man to sleep and formed an operation. Out of this operation, he moved a rib. The translation to the word rib is not simply meaning as in a side of a human's body, but it also can be translated into the side of a building or into the side of a character. It literally means that God took a side of Adam's character and made it into a separate entity, and that was woman. A man with a womb. But God was trying to paramount and show what he was going to do in the future that out of his side would come his bride that's why when you finally see him hanging on Calvary's cross and he's pierced in his side out of his side comes blood and water the birth of a church out of his side out of his rib was going to be born his bride It was there that God told Adam and Eve, I want you to rule this earth. And your job is to keep the serpent out of this garden. Do not surrender your possessions to the devil. Well, friend, we don't have to read too much longer till we find out the devil dethroned them. Moved them out of their possessions and took control of planet earth. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, that the devil is the god of this world. He took control of this world. But God made a promise. The promise was this, that the devil shall bruise. The seed of the woman shall bruise his heel. But the seed of the woman shall bruise his head. And so God said, even though it appears that the devil has the upper hand right now, I am going to crush him in the end. How many know God crushed him in the end? Adam and Eve brought forth children. And as they brought forth children, there came Cain and there came Abel. The Bible says that Cain rules up against Abel and slew his brother. I want you to understand something, friend, that whenever God makes you able, there's the devil to raise Cain. But it does not matter because God will preserve you. God will have a people out of a people. He was not just looking for somebody to follow a bunch of rules. He was not looking for somebody, amen, to simply ostracize themselves from everybody else. He wanted someone to choose him. That's why he sat in that garden, the tree of life, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. There can be no choice if there is no selection. So there had to be a selection. 
because God said, Adam, I want you to choose me. I want you to love me because that's the only way it can be a relationship. Because if I only give you one choice, then it's a dictatorship and it's not a relationship. What are you after, God? What is it that you really are desiring? Well, I showed you right from the beginning what I wanted when I made Adam and Eve. I want a bride. I want somebody that's going to share, amen, the expanse of the universe with me. I want somebody that will revel in the majesty of my power. I want someone that will worship me and adore me and will willingly bow themselves before me. I want someone that even though they're having a hard day, even though things are going wrong in their life, yet they will bow themselves and say, I love you, Lord. And I lift my voice. The Bible then goes on, going through lineages and genealogies, comes to the man by the name of Noah. The Bible said that Noah's name meant rest, comfort, and he found grace in the sight of God. God was trying to work through the generations and lineages of man. But by this time, Man had become evil. The Bible says that man's heart was continually evil, filled with wicked imaginations and thoughts to the point that it actually repented God that he made man because all he wanted was somebody to love him. Now he had somebody that did not even want anything to do with him. It grieved his heart. It hurt him. Do you know how it feels to love somebody and they don't love you? Do you know how it feels to reach for somebody and they won't reach back for you? This was God's predicament. He wanted a bride. And so he said to Noah, you found grace in my eyes. I want you to build me an ark. Make it three stories, one door, all of wood. Uh, wood stands for humanity. The three levels stands for Father, Son, Holy Ghost. One door stood for Jesus, for Jesus said, I am the door. The wood being humanity because the fullness of the Godhead was in him bodily. Uh, he was the living, breathing ark that was going to take us to safety. Somebody shout hallelujah. Well, the Bible speaks about that when Noah got inside this ark, the Bible says God shut the door. I want you to understand something, friend. The first thing that had to transpire was that the fountains of the deep were broken up. Before it could start to rain, fountains of the deep were broken up. This means there were geysers shooting up. Scientists record that there were geysers some 20 miles high into the air shooting up. And then the Bible says the windows of heaven were opened. Many of you tonight are waiting on the windows of heaven to open and pour out to you. But there is a law of God. Before God will open up the windows of heaven and pour out to you, you got to first break up the fountains of the deep. The Bible says break up the fallow ground of you your heart if you will break up the fallow ground of your heart if you will ask God to help you if you will let your heart become sensitive then God will open up the windows of heaven and pour out upon you that's why when you give of your tithes and of your offerings you are breaking up the fallow ground then God said I'll open up the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that you do not have room enough to receive how many give of their tithes and their offerings unto the Lord? You have a right to have the windows of heaven opened unto you. The Bible goes on to say that Noah, while inside of that ark, uh, rocked and reeled, pushed to and fro. I want you to understand something, friend, that the ark, like the church, you get rocked to and fro. There are times that you wish you could get out of the ark. But I want you to understand a lesson real quick. The stink on the inside of the ark. You've got to remember there were all of these animals. These animals had to eat. These animals created waste. You can't tell me they didn't go to, to the bathroom for an entire year and 10 days. 
They were in that ark for a year and 10 days. There was waste all over the place. I want you to understand something. You've got to make a decision that the stink on the inside of the ark is better than the storm that's on the outside. I would rather be in the stink of the house of God than to be in the storm of sin. Give somebody a high five and tell them, stay in the ark. Tell them again, say, stay in the church. Stay in the church. So God said, now abide in this ark, because if you step outside of this ark, you will be destroyed. And don't you understand, friend, this is not a time to get out of the ark. This is a time to stay in the ark of God. The problem came that even those that were in the ark have their own temptations also. For you see, when the floods began to subside, Noah wanted to see a way, find a way. How do I know when to get out of this ark? How do I know when to come out on the other side? How do I know that it is safe to come out of where I am? So Noah sent for the raven. The raven flies out and never returns. The raven is an unclean bird. The raven is a scavenger. More than likely, the raven found some dead carcass and laid its feet on that dead carcass and began to eat. There was an understanding that Noah had. I don't trust the raven. The raven represents your flesh. So Noah said, we need a dove. We need something. We need a dove. That, that which symbolizes the Holy Ghost. So he sent the dove out. The Bible said the dove found nowhere in which to light her feet and came back to, you see, the flesh will always accept what the spirit won't tolerate. The flesh will tell you, it's okay to come in church and just sit there and look. The spirit will say, no way. I will rejoice. I can't accept that. The Spirit says, I will bless the Lord at all times, and his praise shall continually be in my Open your mouth and give God some praise. Yeah, it's in my mouth. And so, amen, the dove returned back again. He released the dove again, and this time the dove came back with an olive branch. The Spirit always has a way of bringing confirmation to you when it's time to move. Why was the olive branch confirmation? Because the olive branch grew low to the ground. That means for it to survive and grow low to the ground, the waters had to be abated. And Noah knew that when an olive branch came back, it was peace. I'm getting ready to get out. The Holy Ghost knows how to sanction in your spirit that you're not staying here. You're coming out. When he released the dove for the final time, then the Bible says she returned no more unto him. And he knew it was time to begin to get outside of that ark. Let me give you an understanding. When Noah walked into that ark, he was the minority. He was ridiculed. He was made fun of. But when he walked outside of that ark, he was the majority. He was the ruler of the world. For God be for you. Who can be? I know they may make fun of you. I know at school they might make fun of you. Why do you carry your Bible? Why are you always going to church? Listen, you might be the minority right now, friend, but you just stick around a little while. For the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords shall return, and you shall be the majority. Woo! I feel the preacher here. My God. When the flood, and I want you to understand something about the flood. When the flood came, 
it did two things. It destroyed and it delivered the same flood. It destroyed those outside of the ark and it delivered those inside of the ark. What did the flood do? It lifted the ark up and sat it on a mountain. Things that should destroy you, things that destroy others, God will make sure it delivers you. You lose a loved one and it should destroy you. But the Bible said in the year King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. High and lifted up and his train. If you lost a loved one, get ready to see God. Job said, I shall see him for myself and not another. Should have destroyed you. Instead, it's going to deliver you and set you on a mountain. Somebody say, yes, Lord. And so God kept moving down through lineages, down through generations, searching, forming, wanting a bride. Uh, the scripture actually states uh, that God moved to the point where he got into the land of Egypt. It was there in Egypt that God used the Egyptians to cultivate a bride. Israel was born in Egypt. That's why I say to you, even though I live in Egypt, I am not an Egyptian. I want you to understand, even though I'm in the world, I am not of the world. For Egypt symbolizes the world. Israel was born in Egypt, born under the bread of taskmasters. That's why when the enemy, the Bible says that when they whip them, so they multiply. Don't you know that in order for you to be multiplied, you must be crucified? Don't you understand that when the devil whips you, get ready for multiplication. Get ready to multiply. Get ready to multiply. So they grew. Because you can't stop God. He is on an ultimate quest. The concept of quest means he's on a journey. Ultimate means this is what he wants out of everything else. God is searching for a bride. And so it was there in Israel when Egypt, amen, began to hold Israel that God said, let them go. Ah, release who I want. The devil can't hold you. When God says, let them go, uh, you, you got to let them go. Because if you don't let them go, uh, God said, I'll execute judgment against every other God you've got. All the ten plagues were against each one was against a God. And so what began to happen is God released his people. But you know the devil, he doesn't want to give up that easy. Seemingly that's what happens to a lot of you. You come to an altar, you get set free. But then next thing you know, you turn around and you can see the dust of chariots. Here comes the enemy coming right back at you, trying to get, amen, you back into slavery. Friend, you don't have to be afraid. The Bible said the cloud that led them stepped in between the Egyptians and the Israelites. The Bible said to the Israelites, it was a light. But to the Egyptians, it was darkness. The spirit that moves you is the spirit that confuses your enemy. The spirit that lifts you up is the spirit that puts your enemy down. For the cloud symbolized the spirit. Ah, uh, the devil was coming. He was coming. He was mad. I don't want to let him go. I, I don't want them, amen, not to be my slaves any longer. I've come to get them back. But God said, not so. I've got other plans for them. And they are my people and they are not yours. And I'm going to make them the way I want them to be. So God took them through the Red Sea. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, they were all baptized unto Moses' baptism. Red sea, red, red, red symbolizing blood. So there was blood in the water. They walked through, amen, the Red Sea. And they came up on the other side to walk into the newness of life. A brand new place, a brand new territory where they had never been. 
But then the Bible said the Egyptians followed them into the water. The Egyptians represent your flesh, represent the world. For the Bible said the waters caved in on Egypt. And don't you know when you were buried in the waters of baptism that your spirit rose to walk in the newness of life and your flesh found a grave. God was making a bride. The cloud, amen, representing the spirit was the baptism of the spirit. The water representing the baptism, amen, of the water. There was both spirit and word. There was both spirit, amen, and baptism that brought them into completion. God led them to Mount Sinai laid out 10 commandments these commandments were not just anything any kind of radical laws laid out these commandments were being given to a bride you must understand the first commandment thou shall have no other gods before me that meant you shall have no other husbands you shall not commit spiritual adultery no other husbands i am the only husband you are allowed to have we've got too many apostolics you've got more than one husband you've got too many gods your child is a god your husband is a god your work is a god ah come on here what happens to us is uh, if your work says you have to come in you will bend over backwards and do what they want. But if you get time off and you can go to church, well, God understands I can't make it. Whatever you bow down to, that is your God. And God said, I will have no other gods before me. There's only one husband. Somebody say there's only one husband. And his name is Jesus. And so Israel was being brought forth to be, amen, the bride. But there came an issue after a while, for God set up a tabernacle. This tabernacle was not your average place. It was a meeting place. God said, make me a sanctuary that I may dwell amongst them. This was mind-blowing. The fact that the God of the universe actually wanted to dwell amongst his people. The fact that God wanted to rub shoulders with his people. And God said, I want you to recognize I dwell in this tabernacle. And when you approach me, there's a way to approach me. You've got to come. If you want to get through the gate, you've got to go through the tribe of Judah. Judah stands for praise. you got to enter into his gates with thanks. And into his courts with, you got to be thankful unto him and bless his. So that's why when you come through the door, you are meant to bring your praise. I want to know how many of you brought your praise. Yeah, you were looking for a blessing, but did you bring your praise? Enter with a praise. Somebody shout hallelujah. God said, you don't ever come before me empty-handed. The Lord started the laws of sacrifice. You don't ever come before me and not have something to bring me. You don't ever come before me and not bring me the best. You don't bring me the lame. You don't bring me the blind. You don't bring me the halt. You bring me the first fruit and you make sure it's the best. God said, I'm not taking this lame praise, this little hallelujah glory i don't want that lame praise bring me the best you won't bring me a praise bring the best hey hey bring me the Whoa! hey is that the best summer you can do is that your best Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Woo! I came to bring my best. I came to bring my best. Somebody just pick up your feet and start marching. 
and say, I came to bring my best. Whoa, I came to bring my best. My call, my call. Woo! Woo! Yeah! I feel a praise in the house. Woo! Yeah! 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 God would reject all sacrifices that were lame. He would reject all sacrifices that were halt. And that's why sometimes we come into service, we don't pray. We come charging right into his presence. We never brought a praise. We didn't bring anything with us. We come charging right in and want him to bless us. And the service is just as flat as a tire with no air. And we want to know why. We're apostolics. We're one God. You're supposed to show up for us. I show up for those that bring me a praise that is acceptable. The Bible said, offer up the sacrifice of praise, which is the fruit of your lips. That's why sometimes you have to open up your mouth. You don't feel like it. it now, that's the kind of praise that God inhabits. That's the kind of praise that thrills God. That's the kind of praise that God gets all excited about and say, now, that's what I want in my pride. Time out for this mannequin praise. Time out for acting like the house of God is a library. One person went to church one day. They were acting a little loud. Woo! Every now and again. Yo! Got all excited. Preacher finally said, uh, Sent one of the deacons back there to quiet him down. Whoa! Couldn't see. Deacon came back there and said, uh, you're going to be, I'm sorry, you're going to be quiet. We're in church, you got to be quiet. He said, man, I feel God. He said, look, you didn't get him here, don't, don't use him here. This is not a morgue. He's alive! He's alive! He lives! He reigns! We celebrate his resurrection! He lives! Open your mouth and praise him. He lives! Oh God, he lives! He lives. He lives. My God. Hey, we need to raise the praise. We need to raise the praise. My God, I feel like praising him. 
Rekatalabo Shakata Rekoto Koto Shekotalabo Glory, 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 glory. Yeah, bring your praise, bring it, bring it, bring it. Hey, did you bring your praise? Did you bring your praise? My God, my God. Hey, ask somebody, say, did you bring your praise? Ask him, say, ask someone, say, did you bring your praise? I know some of you brought your nice clothes, you brought your family, you brought your problems, you brought your money, but did you bring your praise? Hey, somebody brought their praise. Somebody brought their praise. Reco, 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 reshecko. My God! Resheko roko talababasha. Woo! People can get delivered when you praise them. People get filled with the Holy Ghost when you praise them. People get healed in their body when you praise them. People get set free when you praise them. My God, my God. Oh, there's joy in the house. One more time, just lift your hands to him. Just lift your hands. Just love him. Just give him glory. Come on, friend, open your mouth. Bring your praise. Bring your praise. Bring. Come on. Your body might be hurting. Bring your praise. You might have a headache. Bring your praise. You might be broke, busted, and disgusted. Bring your praise. My God. Woo! 
Somebody's getting delivered. Somebody right now. My God, somebody's getting delivered in the Reko Sheko Toto Mokoto. Your mouth. Open your mouth. Your voice.